So, welcome to the Nature Journal Club. Today what I want to do is to show you folks what I think is one of the best fundamental ways of you see something, you want to get it down on the paper. How do you start? No matter what you're drawing, if you're drawing a, um, a bird, a landscape, an elk, whatever it is, my basic approach to drawing all those things is actually the same. And so I want to share with you those strategies. And there will be some nuances and differences for, for different topics, um, but you're going to see that the fundamental approach is actually the same for all these different things. Gesture sketching is, the, is kind of like a, a scaffolding or an outline that you write before you write a term paper. So you have to write a paper. Very often we'll write an outline, that way we know where we're going, what the major points we want to make where are in the, the story we're writing. You then get in there and you write your paragraphs, and then at the end you come along and you check your spelling. If when you are writing your big framework you're worried about spelling, it's just going to distract you. Similarly, when you're drawing, if you try to do everything at the same time, it ends up being really difficult. There are some people that can do it. I look at it and it sort of feels to me like a magic trick. They just sort of sit down and like out comes the, whatever they're drawing. But for me, and for most people that I've worked with, it really helps us if we can break down this process of drawing into some different concrete stages. So at the start, we're going to be making a very light, loose gesture drawing to get down the basics, the oomph of whatever it is that we're looking at. And then on top of that drawing, we're going to put in more detailed lines and structure. And the result is, uh, well, you'll see. Um, so here is the, uh, when you think about gesture drawing, here are the sort of initial basics. The big idea is that a gesture sketch is light, it's loose, and it's fast. So when you're gesture sketching, it doesn't feel like this. You're not going, all right, here's my bird's beak, and here's its eye. And when you're drawing like this, you're so zoomed in on details that your brain can't take in the big picture. And so you'll get a head that may look great. But then when you, by the time you get to the tail, you're going to realize that your head is like three times larger than it needs to be. <laughs> um, and when you're zoomed in on detail, your brain can't take in the big picture. So the start of this, it's light, it's loose, your brain is going around trying to take as much of the big picture in as you can. And it sort of feels like this. That you're 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 going lightly. You're you're, you're it's a it sort of feels scribbly, but it can be scribbly with a lot of intention. So you're not just randomly making marks on the page. You're feeling your way around the object, and then as you start to kind of get lines that feel like they are more in the right place, you're going to be reinforcing those lines. So out of the many comes the one. So you're going to start with this light, sketchy drawing. You're going to block in your basic shape. And then before you get in there and you draw any definitive, deliberate details, what you're going to do is you're going to stop, you're going to back up from this, or even turn it upside down and take a look at it and kind of go, hmm, did I make my head too big? How are these proportions? You're going to check those things, and if it feels good to you, then you're going to go on with all that detail. But you're going to do that on top of a scaffolding. You're going to do that on top of a framework that has already blocked in those basic shapes for you. And that is the power of gesture sketching. One other part about this is that you are not going to get attached to any of the lines that you make. So making a gesture sketch like this is perhaps kind of like going on a blind date. My dad actually set me up on a blind date. It did not turn out very well. Right? The idea of a blind date is not to say I do on the blind date. Because it's probably going to end up like mine. Right? There's nothing, like, you know, you're I'm sure a nice person, but this, this, this isn't working. The first mark that you make on a page, if you feel like you're committed to that mark, and you have to make everything else connect to it, that's, it's, it's not in context with anything else. It's the one that's most likely going to be the line that's in the wrong place. So with all these start lines, starting lines, you want to be non-committal. You want the start of the drawing to be plastic. You have no loyalty, no devotion to any of these marks. And you're going to be willing to give them up for a different one, when a better one comes along. 
And so it feels like this. Well, actually, let's, let's just try this. Um, let's see how well this just deliberate Go drawing works. Also, if you're watching this on the video, get out a piece of paper and try this right now. What I want you to do is to put your pencil down and with one crisp, deliberate line, draw a perfect circle. Give it a shot right now. Draw a perfect circle. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> yeah, me too. All right. You know, my, my perfect circles, you know, can end up a little bit <laughs> wobbly. Right? Some people have actually practiced and they can get themselves to the point where they can do this. It's kind of a neat magic trick. But um, mine usually end up wobbly. So now let's try this gesture sketching our way into a circle. And what you're going to do is you're going to start off non-committal, lightly and loosely, and you're going to make a mark on the paper that's roughly round-ish, right? Start kind of towards a circle. But then what you're going to do is you're going to see how this one, it's kind of collapsed on this side. As I continue to go over this, what I'm going to do is go over this and um, pooch it out on the sides where I want it to be bigger, trim it where you're overextended, and so, so you go over that and over that and over that, and what happens is you start drawing over it and over it and over it until finally you start to kind of, out of the many lines comes the one. You're going to sort of see, like, oh, that's the circle I want. And you get a circle. Give it a try. So you're going to start lightly, you're going to start loosely, we're going to build towards that circle. Then draw another one. Does that come up better? So you don't have to go there right from the start. And we can actually stop the class right here if the world were entirely made out of bubbles. <laughs> right? However, there are going to be some other shapes out there. There will be mountains, trees, rocks, lizards, and the occasional hippopotamus. Um, and for drawing those things, um, a few other strategies are going to come into play. But at the basis of it is this whole idea of we're going to start really lightly and make lots of lines, and then you're going to move in on the ones that you want. You then get the scaffolding, you're going to then put your other drawing on top of it. At this point you're saying, but then, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that in back of my finished drawing, there's going to be this big scribbly drawing with all these marks? Yes. At this point, you're thinking, this is not going to work for me. But wait! But wait, because there is a secret weapon that we have as nature journalists. And that secret weapon is the non-photo blue pencil. You see, there's this one type of pencil. Um, it's not just any non-photo blue pencil. They're the erasable non-photo blue pencils. They've got this little, they've got a little black or a blue band around the tip. You can often get these in stationery stores. Um, you can go to, you can order these online at Staples or things. They are the erasable, let me read you what it says on it. This says, it's the Prismacolor Coal Erase um, Non-Photo Blue, or Copy Not, Non-Photo Blue. And then there's a number that I can't read. Right, that's the pencil you want, right? Um, and the reason that this is such a great pencil is, is it's essentially a terrible colored pencil. If you want to make a sky blue with this pencil, you are not going to be able to. Because it puts down such a ghosty light mark that you go, you can hardly see anything there. And that's why it's so great. It's a terrible colored pencil. It doesn't put marks down. And actually on some types of paper I found it so light that on what kind of slick paper, it really doesn't even leave a mark at all. And you're like, oh, this just doesn't work. But most types of paper, what I can do is I can draw my entire preliminary drawing with this light non-photo blue pencil, have that full scaffolding there, do a ton of like, no, correction, I don't want that head, I want the head over here. And then when you pick up your graphite pencil and start drawing over that, for some reason, our human brains ignore all this light blue in the background. If they notice the light blue, they're going to think you're doing some cool shading effect or something like that. And, and 
And then you could just have, people will see your crisp final lines, the ones that are drawn deliberately on top of the scaffolding that work the rest of the stuff out. Raise your hand if you have not just any non photo blue pencil, but one of these kinds. It has to be this kind. All right, so there's a bunch of people in this room that don't. The good news is I brought for all of you folks non photo blue pencils for everyone in the room who doesn't have one. So you get a new one. Uh, who else needs one? Everybody here? Um, four down this row. Um, and can you help pass these out? All right. Oh, let's get one up here. Do you need one also? I lost mine. Oh, well, you get a new one then. Okay. You get a new one. If you lost yours, you get a new one. We're going to start everybody off. Unfortunately, these aren't sharpened, so if we could pass around some sharpeners, we can help everybody out here. Um, so, you now have your brand new non-photo blue pencil. The idea with this is you don't, you, you don't have to draw your drawing twice. I once saw somebody use one of these. They would make their entire drawing carefully with the non-photo blue pencil and then copy over it. That's not the way that it works. This is for lightly, loosely, in a sketchy way, blocking out the shape of your thing, gives you the scaffolding. And then on top of that scaffolding or that outline, you're going to draw in your final details. And um, so you're going to get a chance to test this. You may find that you love you some non-photo blue pencil. In which case, you get to keep it. If you discover you don't like this, you can give it back to me. I will give it to somebody else. Right? Um, so. With this non-photo blue pencil, um, here is the basic strategies that we're going to be using to use this. There are five different um, items here. I'm going to put them into two groups. The first two, which I call feeling the masses and using negative shapes, these are what I think are my most fundamental go-to, this is how I start all my drawings. I'll either start it with a negative shape and add masses onto that, or I'll start with masses and carve those with negative shapes. Different drawings, it can start one way or another. But it'll start this way, and that gives you the ability to kind of chunk in your basic shape. And then I'm going to want to get a little bit more sophisticated with that uh, sketch, and I'm going to put in some guidelines and orientation lines. You've probably seen people draw human heads like this. They draw a circle and then they draw a line down the middle of the head, right? So that they keep things symmetrical on either side and then a line through where the eyes are so that they can, they're not going to draw a, a head with one eye up here and one eye down here and a nose over here and a mouth there, right? Um, this helps you kind of keep your, your drawing aligned. We're going to look at sort of how to think of the sort of fundamental orientation lines for different sorts of objects. Um, what are the lines that help you orient the parts of, of the drawing? So this first part, feeling the masses and negative shapes, those are your basic fundamental things. We're going to then use some of these guidelines here to kind of refine that a little bit so that when you start drawing in your details, you're going to have an easier time of it. And let's start with sort of defining this first one, where I say, we're going to feel the masses. So I'm not being a populist candidate from here. You know, I feel the masses. <laughs> right? What this is about is sort of looking at the major chunks of meat of whatever it is that you're drawing. What are the big parts? All right, here's my buddy, the giraffe. It's got a big ball of a head in here that's kind of longer down here and it sort of sticks out the top. Right? So it's got a big ball in here, it sort of sticks out the top, and I'm, I'm kind of drawing the mass. It's got a big sort of wad of its nose here. I'm feeling this as a, as a wad of tissue that kind of goes up to this thing here, and this big ball of an eye in here, big ball of an eye in here. I'm thinking of this three-dimensionally as I'm lightly sketching over it. I'm not drawing slowly, I'm drawing fast and loose and light. And what I'm getting is sort of a scribbly drawing that is feeling the masses of tissue or structure or clumps of rock of whatever it is. I'm looking at how broad it is, how tall it is, right? I'm feeling it as a unit. If I can, as I'm doing this, I'm visualizing this three-dimensionally. So as I'm going around the eyes here, I'm imagining that as a little globe. The opposite of thinking this way is to think about negative shapes. 
All right? So these two things, they're opposites, and they go together very, very well. So the idea of using negative shapes is instead of looking at the masses of meat, I'm actually going to be looking at the edges of this shape. And it turns out that if you look at the edge of the shape, like look at the edge of this giraffe here, when you start looking at the edge of the giraffe, you actually get distracted by the giraffe. The giraffe is a very distracting thing. You start thinking like, oh my gosh, my giraffe has eyelashes, right? What? Long, longer, longest, right? Very long lashes here. Those are really pretty. And you get so distracted by the giraffe, it's harder to see the shape. But it turns out that if instead of looking at the giraffe, you look at the shape of the air next to the giraffe, the shape of the air next to the giraffe is not distracting. All right? And you can see those angles and that shape even better. So if I'm looking at here, but I'm not, you don't have to fill in these negative shapes. That's just saying visualize this. I visualize this as a shape. And that allows me to, where I'm looking at the air behind it, that allows me to get that down onto paper more accurately, more easily. So let's use this landscape picture uh, as an example. What could be some, so if I'm drawing the arch, the rock here, I might be thinking of the masses of these, right? What are negative shapes that you see here that could be useful in constructing the same drawing? The sky. The sky? Which, which section of the sky? Right, so notice that when you look at the shape of the sky here above the rock, right? It's easier to see these sort of changes in angles. When you just focus on that, every change in angle, that's much simpler than this rock. You get so distracted by the arch when you look at the arch. When you look at the non-arch, you see those angles and changes. What else? Um, the hollow energy in the middle. All right, so the, 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 the shape made by that kind of hollow image of the, of the, of the arch itself. Yes? The lines of the mountain range in the back. All right, so the lines of the mountain range, and perhaps going into this whole thing, looking at this little kind of, kind of California shape here, All right? The shape of that sky above that mountain range, that's a negative shape. If you were to start drawing the mountain, you'd get so lost in the mountain that probably this shape would end up too small. But if you think of that, well, let, let me kind of show you how I might kind of approach this. And what you'll see is as I draw this, I'm going to start off with kind of looking at some masses, and then I start looking at some negative shapes, and then I start looking at some masses, and you'll see me bounce back and forth between negative shapes and masses. There's no rule about which one you're supposed to start with, but I start by just sort of dancing with both of those ways of thinking about it. So I might start off here with, okay, here's my arch and it generally goes up like this, but here's, I'm blocking in the mass of this big massive rock right here, or this pile of rock that's over here. So here I'm thinking of the masses of these things. But now I'm gonna switch my brain and start thinking of what is the shape of the negative shape of this, of this hole underneath the arch, All right? So I'm attaching, I'm hanging this negative shape off of that positive shape. Now, off of that, I'm going to hang in the negative shape of this little piece of sky here. And I hang that off there. Much less distracting than looking at the mountains. And then there are mountains behind that. And so by using these techniques together, Flipping back and forth between, oh, now let's go back to, like you're saying, the negative shape of that outside edge of that. Let's get those angles and corners. You put those together, you can build up this arch. So with my non-photo blue pencil, that's not what I'd be, be doing to initially block that thing in. So I'm bouncing back and forth between the negative and the positive shapes. Why don't you give it a try? Right? You don't have to follow the exact steps that I just did. But what I want to encourage you to do is to try to get your brain to see if you can dance back and forth between negative and positive shapes. We're not going to be finishing this drawing, but let's just see if you can get those just your sketch light lines down on your piece of paper. See if you can get those basic shapes down on your piece of paper. We're gonna, this is going to be here for two minutes. 
you're watching on the video at home, pick up a pencil and give it a try as well. Your ability to remember the stuff that you're learning from this video is going to be much better if you just you, you kinesthetically mess around with it while you are, are watching. Our brains tend to kind of zone out if we're just listening to something or watching it. If negative shapes are new to you, see what it's like. You may find as you're doing this that this non-photo blue pencil is not really working on your paper. It might be too slick for you. Um, and if so, then just draw lightly with a graphite pencil. But if you like it, go for it. If you can block in this thing, then jump to the next step. Put down the non-photo blue pencil, pick up your graphite pencil or pen, and just start now carefully and precisely drawing over that. And you will notice that all those blue lines seem to melt away under the area where you're adding this darker, deliberate detail. Our eyes are attracted to that contrast. Our eyes are attracted to that detail and your brain will start to, in that section, ignore all that blue pencil that's sitting there in the background. Would you do shadows? Yeah, you can think of those shadows as negative shapes. There's a great little negative shape. There's a negative shape. <coughs> Let's give this about half a minute more. If you haven't carved in those negative shapes around that outside edge, that's kind of fun to do. If you want to take more time with this picture, all the uh, photographs that you see on this slideshow come from uh, Vivek Kanzode's website, birdpixel.com. Um, and he's part of our Nature Journal Club, and he has given us nature journalers his blessing and permission to go out there onto his website and use any of that stuff for our, 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 our learning and sketching wonderful photographs. And you can use those. You can find this in his landscape section. Um, use those as, as inspiration for practicing some of your own gesture sketches. What is it? Vivek what? Um, well, his website, Vivek Kanzode, his website is birdpixel.com. Birdpixel.com. Right. So those are the first two. Right? These negative shapes and the feeling the masses, they're sort of like the yin and yang. They kind of, one is looking at the edges, the other is looking at the inner. And, and you want to get yourself to bounce back and forth between looking at the inner and the outer. And by playing with those, that's how I build up the start of any drawing that I'm doing. And then I stop, I check my proportions, did I make my heads too big? And that's also a great time to put in some reference lines that are going to help you keep the symmetry and orientation of parts of your drawing. And so we're going to look at three ways of doing that. The first is finding the center line. So the center line is on something that is, like our giraffe friend here, bilaterally symmetrical. This side of its head basically looks like this side of its head. And on bilaterally symmetrical things, bilaterally symmetrical means that this side looks similar to this side. There's one way you could slice me in half and I'd have two sides that look the same. All right, so um, if I have two sides that look the same, that center line, or like I'll need the zipper line right down the middle of my body, um, is that line of, of, of symmetry. And it will actually draw that with my non-photo blue pencil across the face of whatever I'm doing. It's gonna help me keep things symmetrical. The close connection of that, so imagine that uh, you know, you're drawing some face or something. And there's that. The close cousin of that are the parallel guides. Now, you probably have done a, a scene in a book on how to draw human faces. They usually start with a, a, an oval for the head. They draw a line right down the middle, the center line, so you get that. And then they draw a line right halfway through to give people the eye line like that, right? And that way people don't draw the, 
um, they don't draw the eyes too high in the head. That this, this point is actually halfway through my head. But also, what, rather than thinking of this just as a center line through here, what I want to think about is that I've actually got several features here. My eyes, my nose, my mouth, bottom of my chin, top of my hairline. I want these to feel symmetrical so that I don't have a cubist face. I don't want my mouth at this angle and my nose at this angle. Um, if you're intentionally doing cubism, different story. But therefore, not just this line, but I want to think of these as other parallel guides. Right? Um, so on the face of my giraffe here, I've got this set of parallel lines cutting perpendicularly across that center line. And those help me align features on either side of the head. It helps me have both eyes on that same line. That ends up being a good thing. I can put all of these things together. That's sort of what my initial sketch. Notice that there's no detail here. These lines here, I just drew these ones off to the side so you could sort of see those and the original at the same time. But that's, notice that there's no detail here at all. The detail, that fun part of the, the drawing, we want to get in and do that, but people usually start on that too early. If you just wait till you block this in, you can then put your detail in, and your detail knows where to go, because you've already solved half of the problems of drawing this picture. You've figured out where things go. Now you can focus on how you're going to make either a soft line, a light line, a broken line, how are you going to draw that little detail over there? And all your details already know where to go. So you don't have to do as much at one time. The more you multitask, the worse you do anything. Right? So this helps you not multitask when you're drawing. Right? Let's take two minutes, and what I'd like you to do is to see if you can drop in a gesture sketch with this bad boy. <laughs> Check out those negative shapes. If you've blocked in your basic shapes already, you can then start drawing over this little critter with more deliberate lines. And notice that those blue pencil lines seem to magically begin to fade away. about to scamper up the tree. Before it does, let me sh point out something that sometimes is a problem. You get into drawing this face up here, right? And you're working all your details on that. And that is so far away from this hand that by the time you get to drawing the little paw down here, this is so far away from that that the alignment of that you may have lost that. So somehow we've got to also it'd be nice to have a way of, as I'm working on this, to be able to keep in mind and to keep track of the way that this part of the drawing relates with this part of the drawing. And there is. And that is our final trick.
It's called visualizing through lines. And to help us really sort of see how this is done, what I'd like you to do is to first, I've got this sort of stylized turtle head here. <laughs> this little turtle eye, its beak. Draw the turtle head. Copy this shape as accurately as you can into your journal. Just copy that shape as accurately as you can. Look up at me when you've got it basically done. I'm seeing a bunch of eyes. Now, would it have been easier to copy this shape precisely if, before you started drawing, you had seen these lines? All right. You notice that the tip of the beak here, um, the circle rests on the bottom of that. This is about this edge of the eye is about halfway through. This stops about halfway up that distance there. But when you're drawing in your turtle eye, you're thinking of the turtle eye. You're not really relating it down to this part or this part. It turns out that this ends into that at the same point where you get the back edge of that. So um, have you ever seen uh, an artist out there somewhere with their pencil kind of going like this. What they're doing is they're taking their pencil, they're finding some landmark in it, and putting their pencil down next to it so that there is a through line. They're seeing like, where does that relate to the other edge? So if I'm looking at an elk here, um, something that I, I have a hard time drawing elks. If you look at a bunch of my elk sketches or deer sketches, let's say this is my body here. I often have this really long neck. On a bunch of my drawings, I got this really, it kind of looks like there's, it's, it's a hybrid elk garanuk or something. And uh, there's this really long neck here. I think the reason is I see this distance here. And so then I take this long distance and I put that up on the back of the neck. All right? But uh, how can it, what is this, uh, how can a through line help me with that? If, if I draw a line right along the edge of its back here, look at where the head is placed relative to that line. So taking that line and projecting it through, where does that relate to this part of the animal? That really helps me. Similarly, I could, you know, where do you stop drawing antlers? Well, take a look at where the tip of those antlers come down on the back and project that down. That's going to be helpful. Here's a strong vertical. What part of the elk does this connect to? It'd be really easy to draw the top of your elk and draw the bottom of your elk, but not have those things be aligned. That's where the through line comes through. And so doing this, visualizing those, even drawing some of those in on your piece of paper is going to be really, really helpful. Take a look at this, and with the people sitting next to you, tell them where you would find and use through lines in the face of this giraffe. First, take a moment with a giraffe. Um, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm a giraffe. Yeah, I'm a giraffe. Um, so, um, with the zebra, uh, get, get your pencil out and align it and see um, what would be some useful through lines to kind of place details. Tell the person sitting next to you. So what, what are some things that I'm hearing? What are some? The what? So the ear um, sideways or down? Down. Down? All right, so I'm going to come down from this, and it goes right through the middle of the center of the chest there. What else? In the outer ear, straight down underneath the chin. So here? 
Yeah. About the tip of the nose past nose the bottom tip of, of the ear. ear. Tip of the nose. So, so horizontally where, where? past the bottom of the ear. Yeah. Wow. All right. Isn't that interesting? So I want this part of my head to align with that. Um, so anything that's a good landmark, drop lines from it. Anything that's a good landmark, see where that projects relative to other objects. You start visualizing this, what it does, and then you draw a few of these across your critter lightly with that non photo blue pencil. What it does is it gets this part to relate to this part. It can get this part to relate to this part. And that, if you, um, sometimes people will do this at the end of a drawing to figure out what went wrong. All right? Um, I, I, I once saw a, an art class where what you do is you do your drawing, then you bring it up to the art teacher, and they were copying photographs, and the art teacher would then start kind of aligning things on the photograph and say, see, yours didn't. All right? But wouldn't it have been more useful to get that early in the drawing process so that you could then have made those changes? You can. The trick is to just check things like this before you get in there and commit to those darker, heavier lines. Let's look at how this might look with our friend the bunting here. Um, so think of what, on this little bunting, what would you use as the major masses of the body? The foot to the head. So if we're, if we're kind of going back for, for, for masses. The head, the middle. So the, the head and then this, this chunk here. So we have this chunk here, we've got this chunk here, so sort of something like this. I, on mine, I put in three chunks, one that I realized later that I totally didn't need. This is kind of an extreme, so uh, yeah, I would, I would go for two here. Just ignore that circle. Right, this, but it's there to say there is no like one way to do it, right? right. I'd like yours better. <laughs> right? Now, so I would start with that, and then on top of this, I'm going to put my negative shapes. Right? The reason that I do that is that if you have a sketch and you've got these big circles on it, which are really useful for getting the positions of things, getting the, um, the proportions, but these circles can be devastating to you if you start following along the edges of them. You can end up with a bird drawing of a bird it kind of looks like you took two circles and put them together because you took two circles and put them together, right? So that's where the negative shapes comes in. And it's, I over-angularize that part of the drawing. So when I'm carving in those angles, I'm looking for where are the kind of inflection points on this thing, right? That are going to carve this head, that are going to carve this body. And that's going to help me kind of fight against the over-rounding that comes by starting with a couple of masses. So the masses want to turn everything kind of blobby and like bubble creatures. And so this wants to make everything kind of stark and angular, right? But you have them both going together and somehow that's going to kind of, they're going to work, they're yin and yang, they're going to work out towards something that is more like the bunting. Then I'm going to start thinking of alignment in this bird where I'm seeing the back, I can think of that center line down the middle of its back. Up the tail and through the middle of the back. And this also, I think, is going to really show the strength of um, using these parallel guides. Because on this, there's a whole bunch of intricate structures, the wings and the tail and all this sort of stuff. And just like on a human face, I want those to be aligned. On this guy, I also want... I've got a, a seat up here if you want. Okay. You want a real chair? It, this is actually, actually one of the real comfy ones. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Check that out. Um, so, but check this out. If I want those structures to be aligned on my picture, a set of parallel guides, ba ding Right? So now the base of my tail, the bottom of my wings, the bottom of my secondaries, the top of the wings, all those, you notice those are parallel. So those are the parallel guides. So if you've just come in, what we're doing is we're looking at what kind of guidelines are really, really useful for blocking in the basics of a shape at the start of a drawing. And in this case, we're looking at how, part of what I'm doing is looking at how things are aligning. 
And what we're doing is on our journal, on our journal page, we're either drawing these, this initial drawing very lightly, or with, um, or I'm drawing it with um, these non-photo blue pencils. And if you just came in, um, are you guys in the same um, homeschool group? All right. So can you teach them about the magic of the non-photo blue pencil? All right. So we're going to do some some cross sharing. I want to. Everybody is going to go home with a new pencil. And at first you're going to be like, "This isn't a very good pencil." But then the people who are here earlier, they're going to show you why these pencils are your new best friends. All right. So you get one. And everybody who just came in. How many folks? Raise your hand if you don't have one. Everybody gets one. Everybody gets one. There's no fighting over non photo pencils. And, 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 you, and you've already got yours. But are, are they, are they this, this, this is this, 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 this special pencil for you. You bet. And one for you. You've already got one. Is, is it the erasable kind? Yes. It's the right one. It's the same kind. Okay. Great. Um, so, and now everybody's got one. Yes? Okay. So at first you're going to say, this pencil doesn't work really well, but that ends up being why that pencil works so well. I know that sounds rather cryptic, but I'm just tossing out Zen Cohen's like right and left today. Um, here we go. Um, so my sketch, starting off, it's scribbly, it's light, it's loose. This would probably be about where I would put my non-photo blue pencil down and pick up my graphite pencil to continue drawing the rest of the bird. All right, so I'm just getting this structure down. Again, I'm not drawing the whole drawing with my blue pencil and copying over that. I'm just getting the bare bones, the structure, the template, or the outline. Um, the, uh, not, not the outline in terms of this, the outline I'm thinking of like when you're writing a term paper. Let's just look at another one, this one from the front. So look at this one. Think, visualize the masses of these birds, the masses of it, the bowl of its head, the bowl of its body. Um, sometimes when I'm visualizing my masses, I try to think of them not as a circle, but as a sphere. And so what I'll often do with the head, for instance, here, is I would think of that as kind of like a fishbowl. With that line being on the bottom being where it intersects with the other oval. It just kind of helps me think of this thing three-dimensional. If this seems confusing, don't worry about it. But eventually what you're going to be doing is as you're blocking things in, you are going to be visualizing, training yourself to sort of see through this object, whatever it is. Sounds weird at the start, you'll get there. Just hang on, keep doing this, it will come. Negative shapes around the outside. So again, those two parts of our, our, our first two steps, the masses and those negative shapes, they work really well together. Yes? I'm just thinking that, like, how do you do this in the wild when animals are moving? Like, do you just, if you do it a lot, are you able to do it fast enough? So, yeah, uh, the question is, how can you, like, this seems great if the bird is three feet tall and doesn't move at all. <laughs> Right? I've got all the time in the world to do this, right? Um, so let's, let's, I'm gonna, let's start thinking about non-birds. Uh, we see how we can make it work with the landscape, and we see how we could make it work with a plant, right? Perhaps if there was a duck sitting still on the pond, right? Okay. Um, for... The songbirds, um, what's going to happen is that, um, usually I, when we're drawing birds, I don't suggest you know, starting with the songbirds. Start with the ones that are gonna be really cooperative, like an egret will go like, this will be a 15 minute pose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, imagine, 15 minutes, go by. Um, so the, um, these guys are more challenging, but eventually the more that you practice it, the more you're going to find that what you can do is the bird will pop up and you'll be like, whoa, man, cool, look at that negative space on its back. Ah, oh, 
oh, okay, and then the red goes away, and you're doing this, you've just drawn that negative shape in, and then you're kind of getting the basics of it in. We actually are going to have um, classes specifically on drawing birds and kind of speed drawing birds. Eventually it will come. Um, the birds are a more sort of challenging extreme end of it. You're absolutely right. Um, actually, uh, if you are interested though in drawing birds, starting in February um, for the next three months after that at the Los Altos um, Museum, um, sort of community mu uh, history museum, I'm going to be doing a series of classes specifically on drawing birds in addition to the workshops which we have here. So those should be kind of fun for you also. But I, I, I agree, you're thinking like, like birds going to move. Yeah. Right? So if there's, and also let's sort of take the extreme example of drawing a bird. Um, if you've ever seen a ruby crown kinglet, a ru watching a ruby crown kinglet is kind of like, like this, like, like oh look, but that, there's this thing, there, there's, oh, it's down, and so there's a bird, kind of just went over there. Right? That comes by your view, you say, you write down in your journal, I just saw a ruby crown kinglet. <laughs> right? um, but other birds, you know, the, the scrub jay will get out there in the morning and it'll put its tail straight down like a plumb bob and it'll down and go, and like, wow, this one's cooperating for me. So like the really hyper warblers, I wouldn't start with those. Once you can kind of get, you know, start your, yourself with more cooperative birds, and then you'll find that then when the wren pops up, you're going to be ready for it. So you can do it. Again, it's going to be practice. It's some pencil miles, but it is absolutely learnable. And these same approaches, these same skills I would, I would uh, do to get those. Um, center line for this one actually shows you right where that, goes right through that red spot, down the belly, down the middle of the tail. And parallel guides Notice how these are parallel with the bottom of the tail. That helps me be able to draw this thing. And then we talked about using those through lines. Right? I want my head to align with stuff down here. So I can pick some landmark up here. It could be the back of the beak. It could be the eye. In this case, I chose the back of the head, just kind of a clear landmark here. I drop a line down from that. Oh, that's going to be above this foot. That allows me to connect this part of the drawing with this. Is that working? Hold that pencil up. There's my through line. So again, this would be the level of detail that I would go with that non-photo blue pencil. And then I'm drawing my thing. One final example here with the elk. Um, if I were to be drawing in, we talked at the, the start about sort of trying to find the major masses of meat of this thing. So now think like a paleo hunter, right? Like where are the big masses of this thing? What are the big lumps? You could think of this whole part as one unit, right? So you could think of this this way, <clears throat> that there's, there's body and head, right, with some stalk connecting them. Or you might think of this as, you know, here's shoulder, here's rump, and then there's a belly in here. There'd be a lot of different ways that you could do that, but um, you want to visualize those, those masses. And again, the lines drawing those, you're starting light, loose, fast. We talked about negative shapes. Um, when I draw an ungulate like this, or a uh, hooved animal like this, I am often starting with negative shapes. Um, so my general kind of go-to approach for drawing something like this, here's some negative shapes. I love that negative shape that you always see under the legs. You're going to draw a cow, you want to get that shape right. Oh, that's going to make it look really cow -y. Um But what I'll often do is I'll look at what is the shape along the back and then I will hang from that the masses of the body, right? So I start with negative shape, and then I kind of go into that massing. And then I hang off the bottom of that another negative shape. So it starts negative, and then masses, and then another negative shape. And you get all this information here in the middle of your critter. Um, 
I love that negative shape underneath the legs though. Another really useful one here, look at this. You can get this shape here. That's really going to help the head of your elk look right. Um, for people who weren't here earlier, when we're talking about negative shapes, I'm saying that when you look at the head of this elk, it can get really confusing because there's all this detail in the face and these antlers. But if you just look at the shape of the air in front of this thing's face, there's no detail here. And just think of this as, as just look at the shape of the air here. It's a line coming up, vertical, and up like that. If I can get that shape without worrying about, oh, that part's antlers, that's brow of my, my critter. If I can see that shape, then that's, I, my, and get that down on my paper, my drawing is going to be a lot more accurate. We already discussed using those through lines with this elk. How to get this leg, where this leg comes in, to connect to this part. How to get this part of the elk to relate to this. That's by projecting lines all the way through that animal. That's all those sort of crazy lines that I was putting in. This is often how I'm visualizing it. Also, you don't have to fill in your negative shapes. I was just doing that to help people kind of see them and think about them. So you don't need to get in there and fill those in. Um, but that's what I'm visualizing in order to draw that edge. So are you ready for a, a gesture sketch challenge? I'm going to put a critter on the board. And what I want you to do is lightly and loosely get that shape down on the paper. Not with one careful, clean, deliberate line, but by, with lots of lines. Like, here's the body, and then I'm, now I'm going to jump over here's that angle, right? Before you start drawing, aww, gotta have a bunny, right? Before you start drawing, take a look at uh, what are you going to use for masses? Circle them in the air. Where are your big major masses of, of chunks of bunniness? What negative shapes, what angles around the edge are going to really carve this bunny? Which ones do you like the best? The ears. That ear one. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And also look at this. This angle here. So up, flat, up. It would be so easy to make this round. If you get that up, flat, up, that's going to feel really bunny-esque. Yeah. Also, this is a neat one here. Look at how vertical that is. Right? See, and you notice how it's easy to see that that's a vertical when you're looking at the negative shape. When you're looking at the bunny, you're distracted by the beautiful bunny. Right? So see the non-bunny and go. Yeah, let's draw that. Let's get that bunny on paper. Lightly, loosely. Drop your shoulders. Breathe. Get that bunny going. Where the eye aligns. Where does, if you drew a through line down the back edge of the ear, where would that come in? That's going to help you not make your bunny too long or too short. Saw a young woman in the back there air drawing. She got her pencil up and was drawing in the air. That's a really good strategy. She's got one eye closed. She's going. That's exactly what you want to do. That's a good strategy. If you haven't done so yet, try carving in one of those negative shapes and see how when your brain now jumps over to looking at negative shapes, how that helps you block in the essence of bunnage. And if you feel you've got your basic shapes blocked out, you don't have to keep going with that non-photo blue pencil. Put down the non-photo blue pencil. Pick up your graphite pencil or your pen and start drawing 
on top of that. And see how you can now draw precisely, deliberately. You're now drawing your bunny eye, your bunny nose. But your bunny eye, you can just work on the shape of it because it already knows where to go. You've already solved half of the problems of drawing before that pen actually hit the paper. <coughs> But he's going to hop away very soon. Mm -hmm. oh, somebody got too close. Oh. Oh. There you go. Oh, pesky bunny. All right. Um, so uh, we're going to try one more. And this one is going to be sort of a very different feel to it. Um, real horizontal here. If you started drawing a mountain, it's, we tend to make mountains too big because big mountains are cool. Right? But notice if you constrained this with a little oval at the start to say this is how big and wide this little zone in here is, then when you get to drawing details in, you're not going to go like, oh, we got a big mountain. Right? So give this a try. Also something you might think about in this is that this, look at this as a negative shape. This is the racetrack in Death Valley. It's this place where these big boulders slide across a completely flat playa. And it's been a mystery to geomorphologists for a long, long time. They've recently just figured it out. Do a little bit of investigation online and figure out the mechanism. It's really interesting. How is it that all of these, it's all kind of like synchronized swimming, they'll all be kind of going the same way, all these rocks scattered across this playa. What's going on with that? Um, give this a try. See if you can sketch the basic shape of this in. And there'll be one minute. Lightly, loosely, quickly. You're getting those shapes in. Instead of trying to jump to that detail right at the start. You're placing the major elements. You're giving yourself a structure that you can later come along on top of and place your careful details. So that's how you start. Now, of course, out there in the field, you can take as long time as you want with that playa until you get dehydrated. <laughs> right? um, so playas stick around longer. Birds don't stay as long. But these same approaches, they apply to everything that you want to draw. So um, here's that bag of tricks. And again, I start with these two, and then refine it with these three. It's not the only way to draw. I'm not saying it's the right way to draw. But this technique has been really useful to me, and I know it's also used by a number of other scientific illustrators that I know. You might consider, which parts of these do you not regularly use um, in your own sketching? I would like everybody in this room, in the next month, to give me 19 gesture sketches. These can. Just take a few minutes, if you want to, for each one. But explore these ideas in 19 different sketches. You can look at them from photographs online or real found objects around your house. But get yourself to play with these ideas, particularly the ones that you tend not to use on a regular basis. And if you'd like to, come on out and join us um, at the end of this month. We've got a field trip at Miller Knox Regional Park over in the East Bay. It's a park you probably have never been to before, and it's a ton of fun. It's a really cool place. And uh, we have a field trip out there. The details about it are on my website. It's a potluck lunch, and your potluck treat can stay in your car, and we eat really well. So bring a plate and an appetite, and it's a ton of fun to get out there with other nature journalers. You can find, learn more about these workshops and things online at the Nature Journal Club um, 
Facebook page or johnmuirlaws.com. And um, I hope that this was of use to you and look forward to seeing you in the field. Thank you for coming. <laughs>